Hello, this is Ben Payton, and you are listening to The Bill Podcast, brought to you in association with georgefairbrother.com, mcgoldrickwatchrepairs.com, and Misty Moon Events. For over 60 hours of exclusive The Bill-related content, including reunion highlights, cast and crew commentaries, reaction videos, Bill Grimmage location videos, off-the-beat bonus podcasts, and much more, join the investigation from £2.49 a month at patreon.com forward slash the build podcast how are you <laughs> very well thank you are you happy to dive in uh, yeah, yeah, I have banished my family. Oh, bless. <laughs> Which is fine because my son's, you know, on his PS4 and we, we won't see him for a long time. All oh, right, okay. Nicely entertained, bless him. <laughs> well, I mean, how how has the last couple of years been for you? Because it, it seems to me the, the pandemic came along right when you were like really busy on stage and telly. So, what yeah. kind of happened personally and professionally for you over the last 18 months, two years? <sighs> It was all starting to all come back together and be nice and everything. And then we started a second string business, like all actors do, teaching, like all actors do. And uh, we thought it'd just be, you know, like a couple of kids and, and do all that. And it was at my son's school and there was meant to be, you know, about 30 kids. And right now about 150. So we were doing really well <laughs> over the pandemic. I didn't stop over the pandemic all this stuff about teachers having it easy yeah that's actually <laughs> so yeah that's our second stream business and that's been doing brilliantly so actually it's been quite hard my agent is a little bit miffed because it's bringing in money and and that's kind of like the priority at the minute yeah it feels yeah. Like it turns up really it must be nice to be able to give something back and share your experience yeah, it is. I was really dubious about it. It was something uh, my husband wanted to do and he set it all up. It's actually rather brilliant. It was a boys school uh, that my son was at. So we were teaching boys and this year it's gone co-ed. So now there are girls as well. And they don't know me from Adam. They don't, you know, they're all up to the ages of 13. So, you know, the bill is a, a non existent thing for them. But it has been great. And uh, we've got sort of, I think, eight kids drama scholarships to the schools that they want to go to. And it is strangely rewarding. I've always been curious about that, because like, do, presumably, do you have to like, even though you're an actor and therefore you know the trade so well, do you have to train to be able to teach it, as it were? No, no, because my son's school was an, is an independent school. So right. basically, you don't have to be a teacher, which is great. So we can just go in there. We teach on a one-to-one -one basis and it's working with kids on monologues and poetry and duologues occasionally if there's two kids that want to work together. And, you know, if there is a second string to be had as an actor, being involved in acting by teaching is a fantastic second string, really, because you're still doing what you love, but helping other people sort of achieve their aims, sort of. It's really, I'm, I'm always fascinated by the, the different, strings to your bows actors can have or like like actors who retrain greg donaldson is now a psychotherapist and a brilliant i one. know uh, i and... love that yeah <laughs> you know do you know what that is so perfect it is so perfect for greg <laughs> he was just the most chilled dude ever yeah. he was hilariously chilled and he was just so much fun it was but that yeah i love that i think that's brilliant before, you know, before you got into that, like you were really busy. Like I had to sort of make a list here. You did two productions of a Petersfield Shakespeare company, including, I quote, a show stealing performance as Polonius in Hamlet. So respect. Yes. Excellent. Should always be played by a woman. Yeah. <laughs> a UK tour of a railway children. Good people for East Riding Theatre in Beverly, which is where I grew up in Beverly. So um... I love the East Riding Theatre. It's just the best theatre. And it's run by Adrian Rawlins, who um, was Harry Potter's dad. Yeah, lovely actor. One of his yeah. many, many credits. But um, <laughs> but my son was, you know, quite impressed. And, and then he came to see it. And it's uh, good people. is obviously very sweary. It's about working class yeah. people in Boston. And it's quite out there. And I think Gabe was about 10 when he came to see it. 
and uh, he was, and I, I could hear, hear him giggling all the way through. And it was, it was, you're just like, you shouldn't know this language. What do you mean you know this language? <laughs> and I think Act One ended on uh, the line cocksucker. <laughs> His laugh wall was my 10 year old son. Well, it, it, there was a, a, a review that said, you know, Joy Brooke has big shoes to fill with Francis McDormand having originated this role and she fills them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Result. Is, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's the part of a lifetime. It's just, it's an astonishing part. And I, I met H and just Adrian and uh, just read for it and just thought, I really want this part. Those parts that you click with and you go, I am. I am a loudmouth woman from Boston who's down on a luck. Give me the part right now. And it was the most fun, literally. Oh. And in fact, I think there's um, somebody posted I, I don't know whether somebody filmed it i don't know whether it was a theater or something but what's the is it vimeo yeah you know, i think there's a copy of it on vimeo oh, which cool. somebody uh which just may i haven't actually sat and watched it but because i'm rubbish at watching myself i find it really hard i just saw ian fletcher on stage and uh <gasps> fletch yeah and he was he was he was brilliant but like he hadn't acted for a little bit and he was saying it was a it was a real test for him as to whether he still wanted to be an actor or not and uh the show was being filmed and i i said i complimented him in the fact that his performance was working for both yeah for the stage and for that camera which i you know i think is a huge huge talent you know to be yeah. working on two levels Totally. I mean, we've we've sort of watched a loads of loads of the National Theatre at home in lockdown and things like that, and we watched uh, Frankenstein with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch being Frankenstein and Johnny Lee Miller being the monster, and it was astonishing because it it played on both levels. It played like a film, um, and nobody was overblown in it, which really impressive. I think. I think now theatre is going to have such a, especially after the last eighteen months. Yeah, I think everyone's got to be so hungry and passionate about getting stuff back on stage that I, I'm really excited just to see where theatre goes next, like, like yeah. a reinvigorated theatre. Well, you know, I really hope that they learn from this because the amount of stuff that has been released as a streaming service has been fantastic. And even if you pay, uh, I mean, just before lockdown, I went to see Amelia um, and then watched it when it was streamed. That's the way forward. For, you know, yeah. I tried to book tickets to go and see Harry Potter, like you do when you've got a 10-year-old son, yeah. who was 10-year-old, not 10 anymore. Uh, and it was, to, for the three of us, for halfway decent tickets, it was like £1,000, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Theatre shouldn't be like that. Theatre should yeah. be accessible to everybody. And certainly if a show is finished, like Frankenstein, and you filmed it, get the extra revenue. You know, put it out there. People will still pay to watch it. Even if they've seen it, they'll pay to watch it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, Ian's show uh, finishes at the end of this month and then it's going on for three months on streaming. And I did a little promo for it to help the production. And like one of the Australian Bill fans has bought tickets to watch it from the comfort of her home in Australia, you know. Yeah. So it's, it's, that, is, that is accessibility. Gotta love the Australian it? Bill fans. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, totally. And it's the way it should be, you know, yeah. because theatre is, is so important, so important. And if you're a working class kid from Yorkshire, you know, to come down to the West End and see something, you've got the cost of getting down there. You've got the cost of staying there if you don't know anybody and the cost of the theatre and the cost of whatever you eat when you're down there. It's prohibitive and it shouldn't. How old were you when you discovered the, the theatre the, and when did the acting bug come into your life? I think I I had, everybody talks about the one teacher that they had. I had like three, actually. I went to a school that was really big on drama and the history teacher, a guy called Mr. Howell, a guy called Mr. Bradley, who was a drama teacher, and my form teacher had nothing to do with drama. Uh, a guy called Mr. Legg was just, they, they were just fabulous. And my parents, I'm one of seven kids, and my parents are definitively working class in Scarborough. And all my brothers and sisters had gone on to get really good jobs. Nobody had gone to college. But, you know, basically they were all, they were running Scarborough between them, the rest of them. And my mum and dad came to a parents' evening and said, you know, well, we think she should go to a bank. Um, and my form teacher said, no, she should go to this drama college in Harrogate that does A-levels. And, um, yeah, Perfect. to my mum and dad, I think 
possibly because they'd had so many kids before <laughs> they were fine with it they were less freaked out because they already had people having good jobs and things and that's so yeah from senior school secondary school i think that was what i wanted to do oh wow so it's quite you know you were quite grown up really yeah uh i mean i think i'd always you know whenever there's school plays you're in them if you you know if you it's great um, <laughs> and so i'd done every school play through it and I left home at 16 to go to do A-levels in Harrogate and basically went, yeah, this is what I want to do. You know, a college where you did plays all the time and then did school work in the afternoon was just fabulous and eye-opening and Harrogate was great. I was, I was in and out on my own, so I was doing lots of underage drinking and going to see the Pogues and things like that in Leeds. It was just, it was, you that's, know. That's quite <laughs> brave to leave home at 16 and move. Yeah, I suppose so. But there was nothing that I that I could have done like that in Scarborough. Mm. So it was a necessity if I wanted to do that. I think, you know, Scarborough Sixth Form now, I think they do drama. But then they didn't. It was kind of an unknown world. Yeah. So Harrogate had this ready-made course. You just got to play. It was brilliant. Is, is that when you're perhaps, uh, professionally anyway, you're happiest when you're, especially in theatre, when you're a part of a company of actors? Is that when you are, you know socially creatively fulfilled you know you yeah know. yeah totally i mean the, the the doing pitman painters and touring for like 20 weeks and then going into the west end was was possibly the most fun i've had in a theater uh yeah. because it was with the geordie Mac and it was and it was a brilliant play and the whole touring thing is actually kind of fun you know if you're with a group of actors that you really like it's, it's murder if you're with a, a group of actors that you don't like it's awful. But that group was just fabulous. And we did sort of 20 weeks going around the country. And Pittman Painters was one of the best plays I've ever been in. The writing, you know, Lee Hall's writing is astonishing. The actors doing it were astonishing. And then you get to, you know, we, we played Wolverhampton, I think, the Grand at Wolverhampton, which I think seats about 1,200 people. And I think we had about 40 in on a Saturday <laughs> <laughs> you got to go do you not know that this is a brilliant brilliant play and you should all come and see it i love it when you go to places like bath and it sells out and i love it when you go to places like wolverhampton which you know there's nobody there it's like you can play ping pong in the background because nobody's watching um, <laughs> but yeah that's the wonder of theater i think as opposed to filming because filming you just turn up you do your bit and you go even if your part isn't the biggest part in the play you're there for the duration so you yeah. do know and you find out about people and yeah Pittman was just apart from you know having to leave Gabe being at five years old and sort of going that was the best theatre job that they've done I think and we got the reward of going to the West End which was yeah nice. yeah oh which that must be so special it was it was great I you know I, I when I think about what I need to check off on my list I've done quite a lot of it you know yeah. I wanted to do the West End um, wanted to do telly so you know a lot of the stuff when I look back I go yeah nice parts I did good parts and stuff thing is though you know everybody's out there wanting good parts it's it's tricky when you get to this age I think have you ever wanted to direct I think I would always have been frightened of doing that but I think bizarrely teaching has shown me that I can yeah and I can come up with some some interesting stuff so yeah I wouldn't mind having a go I think it must be a lot of pressure to do to sort of take it all on your shoulders and go this is a success or a failure by what I choose to do but I'd, yeah I would I'd love to give it a go I think have any of your students shown you sort of like that kind of star quality where you think you could go the distance yeah there are there are a couple there's a couple who who you know you kind of go and the worst time is, you know, when you see somebody who could do it standing on their head, but actually it's not their passion. And it's right. not really what they want to do. We had a kid who left last year who was fabulous, just fabulous. But he's never going to be an actor because it doesn't really interest him. But you put him on a stage and you give him a speech and you work with him on it. And he, he did, for me, he did a piece from Cursed Child, put together oh. a piece for that, and he was playing Scorpius. And he was fantastic. 
topic. And um, he did his little, he did his exam. And the, it was, we did the, some of the exams on screen because of the pandemic. And he sort of sat on his chair and he just did the speech to the person on the other side. And we couldn't, the exam ran over by about 20 minutes because she was just chatting to him about what, you know, what was going on and why he felt like that and what was going on. And it just made me really happy. But yeah. a bit kind of like, please choose acting because you're really good at it. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe one day you will you know, come full circle and pick it up. That's all you can do, isn't it? You offer it up. And, uh, you know, and those kids that might not be ready now might be ready 10 years down the line or, you know, finish university and go, actually, give that a bit of a go. So, I mean, I've heard people say that, you know, if giving advice to young people saying, if you want to do it, make sure it is like the only thing in the world you want to do. You've got to love it and give it passion. But is that in this day and age, do you have to have a second string to your bow to survive? I think you do when you get a bit down the line. You know, uh, we have a house and we have children or ch a child and, and a dog. It's very important. And, <laughs> and all this stuff. You know, you have to have X amount of money coming in in order to make it work. And so, therefore, for me, a second string is necessary because you know you can do nothing for six months and then you can have a flurry of work but even if you get quite well paid for that flurry of work it's got to cover the last six months when you didn't do anything yeah. so a second string for me is absolutely imperative but I think when you're younger you know when you can survive on beans on toast and sleep on somebody's floor then not so much you know it's yeah. it's the way the world works isn't it you know you get about yeah. you get you start to want Sky TV. Yeah. <laughs> was it the Guildhall you trained at? Yeah. yeah. Went to Guildhall, which was, it's it's the most brilliant school. I mean, they talk about the big five in drama schools and, and uh, you know, RADA has the, the history, I suppose. But Guildhall was astonishing. It was uh, it was an amazing three years. I had, uh, Gregor was in the third year when I was in the first year. Joe Fiennes and uh, Damien Lewis were in the second year. The year behind me was Dominic West. Wow, yeah. So it was it was a, a really bumper boys time. I think they are still absolutely brilliant. I, I, I don't really know. But at that time, it seemed to be the perfect storm of great lecturers. Mm -hmm. And there are so many colleges now. And it slightly freaks me out because I think the one thing that a really good drama college education gives you is a window into the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they they had their show when, when everybody does speeches and all the agents come. The majority of my year at that time, you know, finished that night with an agent, wow. which I don't think I don't think happens, you know, because there are now so many drama colleges. There's always the temptation at the minute to go to somewhere smaller, somewhere maybe that's not quite so well put together because everybody's jumped on the bandwagon. There are colleges left, right and centre now. And I think I was really lucky to go to Guildhall. And did they? Did you study acting on screen at the Guildhall? No, wow. <laughs> no, wow. not at all, not at all. I was convinced I was going to do Shakespeare. I was convinced when I left that I would be the one who went away and did Shakespeare. We all sort of put ourselves into little groups as to you know what what people were going to do. It never struck me that I would be that I would do anything on telly because they sort of do casting against type. So I, I didn't really play a juve lead. I didn't play my own age mm. until the very last show of Guildhall. And I got, I, I think actually I was petrified of it because I had some really fantastic castings in my third year. I always I really thought I was good enough to do it. And I think you have to kind of go in with that confidence to a certain extent, I think. Well, so what kind of roles were you playing if you weren't playing juvenile leads? What were uh, I played quite a lot of strong older women bizarrely you know where i came from uh but there was there were the girls who always played the jubilees you know the little tiny petite uh, gorgeous girls i think i played grandmothers and i played i, I tended to play strong you know simpering or weak mm. which i think has kind of carried on i think uh, i think that's just kind of how i look i suppose how i am not necessarily true, but, you know, I think that's what my casting was at college. And and I also, yeah, just, just generally kind of like quite bullshit women. 
Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that so, didn't change much. <laughs> no. Well, you, you play them brilliantly. <laughs> you do. I don't think many people can leave drama school and land like a, a regular role on telly and like you, you're in the thin blue line, like straight yeah. away, which is like, and like we we were talking about acting for acting on stage, but also acting for a camera right there. I'm guessing acting comedy in front of a live audience and a camera is also a challenge of like, where do you play it to and, and pitch it? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think, it was like watching a masterclass though. It was brilliant. They were, you know, you just watch these guys and just go, holy crap, that is a, a total different level. Mm -hmm. And I think it is that thing when you've, when you've been at drama college, and you've been playing with the same people for three years and then you come out into the real world and you get your first job with proper grown-ups who've been doing this properly and you kind of just become a sponge. And, you know, Rowan Atkinson was a genius. The man is a genius. Yes. And I remember, you know, they had the most amazing guest stars. Stephen Fry came in to do a, a guest spot. And you're kind of like, holy crap, Stephen Fry. That's just like, just, just too weird. Um, and you'd be sitting in the canteen having lunch. And it was just awesome. And it's, awesome. And, and, it, and it is still very, very funny. It is, it's a very, I think it's underrated uh, now. Yeah. We, we... I, I think it is really. I, you know, it was a really good cast, and some of the writing was brilliantly written. And and Ben Elton wrote some fabulous gags. David Haig was extraordinary. His that kind of, you know, really coiled up. <laughs> but only yeah. he, that he he delivers that, that wonderful line of being really pent up and angry. Yeah. Man plays I mean, he is. He is. Just, I mean, I think he is one of the greatest underrated actors yeah of yeah because yeah. he can do anything you know he is just awesome to watch he can bring everything which uh, is unusual i think for actors i think actors get their thing and they stick with it and mm. he's you know he's out of the box who are your sort of as you were growing because like i mean you are awesome on screen so i'm amazed you had no training so is that <laughs> Is that instinctive or was did you have any inspirations growing up for playing those kind of strong female parts or like where does it come from? I grew up in the in a golden era well, watching, you know, Diana Rigg, um, Glenda Jackson, yeah. just these women who, when they were on screen, just owned it. I think watching is the best way to learn because the more you see, the more you watch, the more you can see tricks you can see just how much eyes can do i think on screen and that you don't have to be big the ellen pasco i did a deal and pasco um after i did uh peak practice and before i did the bill and that was another kind of master class just watching warren because mm. he's he's so big you know as a as a, a human being he was a big character but he managed to still be big on screen without being big. Yeah. If you see what I mean, he could he he could hone in on exactly what he wanted to do. That was kind of awesome mm. to work with. He was he was just lovely. We we sat. I think was the first one to go out after the watershed because I think it was quite rude. Yeah. <laughs> and we just used to sit in the bar. We, we they put us up in this hotel on the in the middle of the bull ring in Birmingham. So it was a hotel on a roundabout. And everybody just used to sit in the bar and drink and talk. And it was brilliant, I think. It was a great loss when he died far younger than he should have done. Was the bill on your radar before you were in it? Had you seen it? Had you been... <laughs> <laughs> I think I was one of the few people who hadn't done a guest spot. Yeah, before absolutely. The role. Um, and I, I, my brother is, is proper Yorkshire. My, my eldest brother is proper, proper Yorkshire. Uh, I got into Guildhall and he was like, right. Okay. And then I got in blue line. He was like, right. Okay. And I was getting all these jobs and everything. And he'd go, you're not a proper actress till you've been on the bill. You're just not. <laughs> and it was like, okay. And so I got the job <laughs> and I was like, I'm on the bill. I'm on the bill. And he was like, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I mean, I was obviously, cause it was on all the time, you know, it mm. was, so I, I was aware of it, but I'd never auditioned for it. And, I, and in fact, I think when I got it, my agent went, don't do it. 
don't they? Because really? I'd just been, I, I wasn't that long out of college. And mm. um, he said, that, you know, it's, it, it's, you'll get stuck. You, you. And I do, I do kind of understand that way of thinking, I think, that idea that it, it's a long running drama. And if you get into it and if they like you, then you're there forever. But it was just, it was just too much fun to turn down. Yeah. Really. Yeah. The whole idea of this Yorkshire bird was great. <laughs> she was an awesome character. I mean, I, this this is the era, I, you know, me, my mum, dad, brother, we watched it as a family, you know. And, like, you just you were just like a grenade when you arrived, you know. It was just like this awesome badass has arrived. She takes no shit from anyone. And yeah. you did own it, you know. You proper <laughs> owned every, every scene. I'm in awe of just you came into and what was still a very you know male cid team at that time as well wasn't it male yeah yeah and it was just me and libby yeah i did have an armoni suit as kerry which was uh because i it was mine and they bought it off me because uh i did it i I used it for the casting and they went, that looks really good. That's what we want it to look like. And I went, well, you can buy my suit if you want. So they did. And then they gave it to me when I left. So it was a really good value suit. <laughs> How similar was the Joy Brooke of 1998 to Kerry Holmes? You know? I don't think I've ever been that mouthy, really. <laughs> but I know her. I mean, I certainly, you know, have my moments. My husband said I'm full right, which I think is the polite way of saying just bloody rude um, sometimes. <laughs> and I can get, I understand that. I totally understand that. I loved the fact that she came in and she didn't take any shit from anybody. And it was, for me, it was kind of a golden age of the actors who were there. They were all awesome. There wasn't, you know, I felt comfortable walking onto that set because there wasn't one person who was tricky. And I think that is a huge gift if you're coming onto something new. Everybody made me feel welcome. When I did my initial audition, they said, you have got a clean driving license. And I went, yeah. So it's provisional, but it's really clean. I haven't spilled my tea in it. And, um, and then I got the job. And in between getting the job and starting the job, I did one of those week, week-long courses in driving. And I'm pretty sure that I was going to fail until I told driving instructor that he had to pass me because I had a job in the bill. And if, I didn't, if he didn't pass me, I couldn't do my job in the bill. And I swear, one of the first scenes that I ever did was driving Sean Scott out of the out of the out of the yard, and and I told him, and he went, "Oh shit!" <laughs> he said, okay, "Okay, put it in first, and just floor it." I said, "But that'll do really bad things to the engine." And he went, "No, it'll look really, really cool." <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so I passed my test literally a couple of days before I started on the bill, wow. and then the first scene was driving. But it did. It looked great. They were like, you know, the like the smoke coming up from the wheels and everything. With hindsight now, having driven for a really long time, I totally understand why. And you really shouldn't do that to your car. <laughs> um, but yeah, bless. He was a bit of a guardian angel for me with that. Oh, what a hero. He was. He was totally my hero, Sean Scott. The most gorgeous of men. The the stories you will get out of Sean Scott are legendary. He he just knows everybody. Yeah. He knows everybody. He's worked with everybody, and he is the total package. Sean Scott. Did you spend any time with any real police officers? Did they like send you out with like CIA? Yes, they oh, wow. did. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was Whitechapel. I went around Whitechapel for I think it was just a day. It was Whitechapel, so you know there was stuff going down yeah. and drug busts and you know all this lot, and they were really good at that. And then of course they had all the. The police advisors who were always on set who were great. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, you know, learning how to use the stick thing, how oh, to yeah. flick that out was just so cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody got injured at some point with those sticks. <laughs> uh, not, on, not, you know, filming, but just because people were playing with them off <laughs> and doing all of that. Uh, yeah, we used those a lot. Learn how to carry my, you know, my, my flashlight with my, with my weapon, yeah. which was very good. I think I had a gun in one of them. Or yeah. maybe I disarmed somebody with a gun. You stopped Rita from shooting the um, bloke in the head down in the cellar. Yes, in, in the years. cellar, that was it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. And, you, and you say, look, Rita, go ahead. You want to shoot that piece of crap? That's fine. 
but who's going to look after your daughter? <laughs> you know. <laughs> See, good sense all the way through. <laughs> totally good sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and totally. it's great because Ray Ashcroft appears over your shoulder and you just go, stay. <laughs> Hello, this is Ben Payton and you have been listening to The Bill Podcast, produced and presented by Oliver Crocker, with special thanks to Joy Brooke, co-produced by Ben Adams, Sarah Kuiper, Alex Mockler, Laura Pinifay, and Simon Wolfe. Executive produced by Ben Ashmore, Daniel Christopher, Alana Dewar, Andrew Dyack, Paul Dunn, Dan Evans, George Fairbrother, Luke Hegarty, Edward Kellett, James Ledain, Simon McGoldrick, Lucy McNeil, Gary Moncur, Stuart and Jen Morris, Claire Norbury, Tom Sherrington, Angel Stannard, Patrick Stratford, Michael Weil and Sarah Went. Brought to you in association with georgefairbrother.com, McGoldrickWatchRepairs.com and Misty Moon Events. For over 60 hours of exclusive The Bill related content, including reunion highlights, reaction videos, cast and crew commentaries, Bill Grimmage location videos, off the beat bonus podcasts, and much more, join the investigation from £2.49 a month at patreon.com forward slash The Bill Podcast. <laughs> <laughs>